Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness towards us, Lord. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, that you are faithful. You're always there. You're always willing to forgive. You're always full of love. Thank you for your goodness this morning, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Worship you, Lord. Praise your name. Give you glory, Lord. Mighty God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, we worship you.
to know hope when there is hopelessness, to find restoration, Lord, even in the midst of great chaos. We give you all glory and all praise and all honor this morning, Lord. And we say you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, as we gather this morning, we gather amongst millions and millions of people throughout the world. Those that are with us online, Lord, we thank you for them. Those that are with us, even although they're not with us, we thank you for them, Lord. We thank you that where you are here, Lord, your presence is here. Where two or three are gathered, you are present with us. And we praise you for that. And Lord, just anoint this time as we look at what's stopping us in our lives. What causes us to hesitate in terms of the work that needs to be done. Give us a sense of what we need to do, Lord. Help us to learn from the story of Peter and Cornelius. This incredible story, Lord. May it be a blessing. And, uh, and just anoint us in every way. Holy Spirit, come. Come and speak to us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Bless you. Good morning and welcome. And uh, it's wonderful to see some friends uh, that I haven't seen for a while. That you're back in church. Some people that are visiting. Flo, happy birthday to you. <laughs> Bless you. I think two days ago. And other ones that are celebrating. Jared is celebrating his birthday. So a very happy birthday to Jared. He's 30 years old. Mate of mine that we run together with. We are live streaming this morning in a very uh, technical way. <laughs> I remember the good old days we used to use it. our toaster. It was the best thing to hold our cell phone. And we kind of rolled it back there again. So forgive us. We're getting it together. But uh, we will get there. So welcome to you all. Just as we continue to worship, we have an opportunity to bring our offerings to the Lord. And uh, this is a time of worship. It's a time for you just to come before the Lord and just say, Lord, here I am. Thank you for all that you've given to me, and I'll give back a little bit to you. And also, those that would like to use Snap Scan, we have plenty of things called Snap Scan. There's a Snap Scan at the back of the church on the wall, just next to there's a poster on the side, on that side. If you want to use Snap Scan, it's available to you to use as well. Uh, but let's just spend a bit of time just giving our offerings to the Lord this morning. Thank you.
Lord, just as we meet this morning, thank you for the blessing that we have in being able to bring our offerings to you. And I pray that they will be used for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So the fact that we're excited this morning, we are going through transition. We spoke about that a few weeks ago. And uh, how, you know, when you go through transition, you've got to find your feet. Sometimes uh, the very mechanisms that you used to have, you don't have. But we are doing it together. Are we together? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting and, uh, and frightening all at the same time. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm just uh, feeling in my spirit that God is busy doing something. And uh, there's, there's a wonderful sense of that. There's a sense of, of a need for the church to, to rise up and to do the things that the church is supposed to do. And there are a lot of things that have been stopping us up to now. And so my message is literally called, What's Stopping You? And I don't know about you, but it, it's, we've got to a place where we are very comfortable behind our boss. We uh, find ourselves uh, a little bit suspicious when we walk around and you know, we're in situations where it's a little bit different and people are not wearing their masks. Uh, we tended to get into a place of almost hibernation, and winter doesn't help us a lot, eh? But we, we, we tend to feel like we want to stay away rather than press in. And I really sense that uh, the Lord is calling us to press in. You know, the Lord is calling us to look at the things that have been stopping us up to now in terms of His kingdom on earth as in heaven. And there is a lot of work to be done, friends. We cannot be stopped now. And so I want to share the story of Peter and Cornelius. It's a wonderful story. And give you some keys as to how to move forward so that you're not stopped in extending the kingdom of, of God on earth as it is in heaven. We have only one chance, friends. It's now. There's only one life that you have, and it is now. And we need to take it seriously. We can't... I think there's a lovely of Afrikaans, pur pur. Is that right? We can't pur pur right now. We've got, to, uh, we've got to get with the program. And so as we share the story, as, as you hear it, I trust that God will give you an understanding of some of the things that have caused paralysis in your own life, some of the things that have been restricting you in terms of extending the kingdom of, of God, and how we can move forward, how we can get into that space where we are running, where we are flying with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, and with the work that needs to be done. Are we together? And so if you'd like to turn with me to Acts chapter 11, and we're going to be reading the story from verses 1 to 18. This is within the context, and just remember that, this is within the context of a very powerful and special time in the journey of the church. We read it towards Ascension Day, which is a, an incredible day when, when the Lord ascended into heaven. We read it towards the day of Pentecost, where we celebrate the Holy Spirit literally poured down onto the church. And we're sharing some of the stories that come a little bit after that. But we're sharing the stories of the impact of that moment when God transformed simple, ordinary people into extraordinary people because of His, His Spirit. So let's read. Let's get into it. Acts chapter 11 from verses 1 to 18. The apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with him? <laughs> Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. Hold on to that. I was in the city of Joppa praying in a trance. We'll talk about that just now. I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. And then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. I think I would have been in the same situation. I was in. <laughs> <laughs> a Jew and confronted with this vision. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, and this is a very profound and powerful statement. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, 
And then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right there, three men, three times, three men, three times when Peter denied Jesus, three times when he's reinstated. Let me tell you, he is well aware that the Lord is speaking to him right now with those threes. And so, right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was standing. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with him. And then there's six brothers. <laughs> These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Just about about, I don't know times, will be saved. And uh, that's another bit of theology that I will not be dealing with today. <laughs> as, I, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as He had come on us at the beginning. And then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So God gave them the same gift He gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I to think that I could stand in God's way. How many times are we standing in God's way? Who was I to think that I could be standing in God's way? And when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God for it this morning. And Lord, just ignite our hearts, help us to see what is stopping us in terms of extending the gospel, extending the kingdom, and maybe find some truth in the story that will help us to move forward in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, right in the deep uh, in, in Acts chapter 11, verse, verse 1, we see the very first thing that stops us from spreading the word of the Lord. And the first thing that stopped Peter was criticism. Amen. Criticism. So he goes back to Jerusalem and he shares what's going down and these circumcised believers, so they're believers, they have been transformed by Jesus, but they are objecting to the fact that Peter had been called to send or to, to move into the spaces of being with the Gentiles. And friends, as you think about criticism today, it's often the very first thing that stops us from doing the will of the Lord. That critical spirit that you know is resonating and bouncing up and down inside your brain. That old voice that often says, you know, criticizes you for the very you that you're about to have. And, you know, it can often be the very people that are closest to you that criticize you the most. And so the very first thing that Peter finds himself confronted with were these voices of criticism from the early church. And these are supposed to be brothers and sisters and believers who should stand shoulder to shoulder with him, who should remember also the prophets of all that said that the word would go out to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth, they should have been standing with him, but they were criticizing him. And as we move forward, friends, as we go into the place where we move out, what stops us so often is that voice of criticism. It can so often even be your family or your friends or your mother or your father or a parent or a teacher. That narrative that's still in your brain that you cannot get rid of. And you've got to confront his friends. You've got to focus on what God is saying and not what the critics are saying. The second thing that we see is that Peter tells this community who are criticizing him, he tells them the whole story. He tells them the whole story. I love this little piece of information. Because very often when you are thinking about doing the will of the Lord, and I'm going to explain that there are times when it's the will of the Lord and it's your own good idea. There are two big differences here. But very often when it comes to doing the will of the Lord, and you've got these critics, you kind of think, well, I'll just tell them some of the story, but not all of the story, you know? Like, I'm going on a mission. Well, where are you going? Well, I'm going somewhere north of uh, South Africa. Well, where is that north of South Africa? Well, I can't really tell you, but it's somewhere out there. We're going to go and see some people. What kind of people? You know, we'll tell a little bit of the story. We we'll won't tell the whole story because we we're afraid of the critical spirit and the thing that they would say to us. I remember just then and I, I think I've shared the story of going to Latvia. 
And uh, I, I must confess that when we did our training and our equipping for, for, for mission, I was not expecting to go to Latvia until we got with the program. And then we had these tickets and we had, you know, this, this, the, these visas that we had to go we had to get into Latvia. We also found out that we were smuggling Bibles. I think I've shared that with you before. So it wasn't just going into Latvia, but we had Bibles at the bottom of our suitcases that needed to be smuggled literally into Latvia. I hope I don't get arrested right now. I just feel that I'm on camera. I'm telling you stories of what happened. This is long ago. This is 1995. I think you can get bubbles into that in now, no problem. But it's very really easy to tell some of the story you know, about what you're going to be doing and not the whole story. And what's significant about getting over the critics is to tell them exactly what you're going to be doing. Tell them what's going down. Don't pull anything back, but tell them exactly what's going on in your heart. And so that's what Peter did, confronted by the critics. He spoke it out exactly as it was. The third thing that we see in the story, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, <laughs> because what happens to Peter, and now I can imagine explaining this to your very uh, religious-minded friends, that you were suddenly taken into a place of a trance. You know, when we think about chances in our world right now, you think about short cigarettes or some, you know, <laughs> stuff that changes and transforms your mind. And then you kind of, you know, you will move into a, into a trance-like state. You know, isn't that right? And the, the, the world has taken this. And let me promise you one thing, because I've been there 42 years ago, you will not get anything out of any chance if you've taken some substance. It will make you feel terrible, and you will see some horrible things, and it's got nothing to do with Jesus. Are we together? So let's just be real. With it. it does work, but not properly. <laughs> you like it's a person, yeah? Tell the whole story. Yeah, tell the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> we the whole story now. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I used to tell the, uh, the whole story of my salvation and how I came to the Lord. And I tell the story about this little boy, this young boy, you know, all the stories of what he did, and I look at him and what I did. And then I come to the end of the story and I say, do you know who that boy was? It was me. You know, and I get and I go, ooh. You know? And then the Lord said to me, who's getting the praise there? And he was you. And so I stopped doing it. So you can hear my story one day. You'll come one and one, I'll tell you. But not today. But let's get back to the trance thing because it seems like Peter was taken into a state of a trance. Now the, the Greek word for trance is ekstasis which is the same word that we get for ecstasy. And ecstasy in the sense of not that the pill, you know, this is another thing that we think about when we think about ecstasy. But this is a sense of a spiritual experience that Peter was having, which brought about a vision of what he needed to see for the extension of the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but I have experienced ecstasis in my life, a moment of ecstasy. Very often when I'm running up in the mountains and there's nobody else around, it's the most beautiful time, I have the ability and the opportunity to find myself in a place where I'm worshipping with all of my heart, my soul, authentically, uh, moving to a, into a place where I'm speaking in tongues. Sometimes I shout and scream, sometimes I pray over the city of George, but I'm in a place of ecstasis. I'm not afraid, I'm not worried about anybody else around me. It's just between me and the Lord. And there's a sense that you get into a place, a spiritual place, of almost an out-of-body experience. There are times when we are worshipping, and even and then when, you, when you worship, but you are sometimes get ecstasis. You know, when you are worshipping, you just, there's, <laughs> there's no line that you can, you know, you know all that scripture, and you, you go up to the, the one, you leave the 99, and, you know, you're in that place of ecstasis of worship, and there's a connection between you and the Holy Spirit. And there's no space. And I really sense that we need to find that more often in our lives. That ecstasis, that place of ecstasy where we connect with the Lord at a deeper, with the Lord at a deeper level. You know, where it's more about Him and, 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 and less about ourselves. And there's this beautiful connection. The gifts of the Holy Spirit have been dampened. It, it, it concerns me, friends. You know, that we're not prophesying, we're not speaking in tongues, we are not exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit with ecstasis, with ecstasy, the sense of 
of what God is going to do. And so here he was on the top of the, you know, top of the of, of his house, and he's in a state of worship, and he's he's honoring and worshiping the Lord. And this vision comes down of this of this cloth, and it's filled with unclean animals. And I can imagine, you know, I can imagine them almost saying to the Lord, you know, is this really you? you know? Why are you giving him this, this vision now? You know, I'm in this ecstatic place of worship, and you're giving me this crazy, horrible vision of all these, you know, unclean animals. And God is showing something very deep within this trance. And so the unconscious is brought to conscious by the power of the Holy Spirit and Peter to reveal something about moving into the space of the Gentiles. That's what God is doing. He's opening up his spirit to understand where he's, where he's about to go. He's finding himself hearing what God is saying in terms of the next steps. And it is God that is guiding him, not himself. And so as uncomfortable as the vision is, God is preparing him for the next step. Can I just say that when it comes to times where the Lord is speaking to us, it can become uncomfortable. There are moments in your life where you realize that you've got to do something for the Lord, and you know that you know that you know that you've got to do it, but it's uncomfortable. And very often we can find ourselves moving in places, and this is where we'll get to in the next part of the story. We're moving into places where we think that it's the Holy Spirit, but it's not. And so what we find in the next part, and uh, please forgive me, let me not miss this piece out. Because in, in, in the situation of the vision and the trance, as God is directing Peter to go to the Gentiles and to go to Cornelius' house, he gets into a place of doubt. That was the next point, point number four, if you make making notes. And he says, surely not, Lord. Surely not, Lord. A very real, authentic <coughs> response to what God has revealed to them. Surely not, Lord. This can't be possible that this is what you want me to do. And again, friends, when God is moving us, what often stops us is our own inhibition, our own inability to really believe that this is what the Lord is saying that we need to be doing. I think I, I say to you sometimes, I need to be careful that I don't say I say to you often, but I say to you sometimes that when it comes to the voice of the Lord directing us, you need to listen to the harder voice, not the softer voice. It's so easy to listen to something that kind of panders to your spirit, like, you know, we're going to go to Big Bay and go surfing, that sounds cool. And um, then we're going to go and uh, do a little mission along wilderness and we'll stop at the coffee shops. You know, that sounds really great. Anybody with me this morning? You know? <laughs> and then I can say, you know, we're going to go to Safe Fontaine and we're going to go to the community and we're going to go door from door to door. We're going to find out which little houses have got no parents in them? Which homes have got some challenges in terms of no food and no shelter and no blankets? That's where we're going to go. Are we together? That sounds a little bit more like the Lord is leading us, He's guiding us. But what comes with that surely not the Lord is confirmation from others. And this is the next point. Because when Peter sees this vision and he recognizes the fact that the Lord is leading him into a Enemy territory, literally, into the Gentile space, there is confirmation from others that he's doing the right thing. And so Caesarea Philippi and John are far from each other. Remember that Peter is in Caesarea and on the coastline, by the way, but he's now Paul. So these people have traveled from Joppa to his house, have fallen to now come back to Cornelius' house. It's a long journey, but they are determined because they've also heard from the Lord about what Peter has been called to do. Very critical in the, in the space of discerning the will of the Lord because others will confirm that it is God and it's not you. Very important friends that you have confirmation. You have confirmation and from trusted people very often and sometimes even strangers. So these were strangers to Peter. They were believers that we understand from Scripture but they had been sent by the Lord to confirm the very thing that was inside of Peter's heart. God does not move without confirmation friends. Otherwise, it's a, it's a good idea, not a bad idea. And I find so often people will, will say, we're going to go and do this, or that, or the next thing, and it's a good idea, but not a bad idea. You know, they've had this, this hunch that they need to move and do the next thing in business, 
or at home or with their family or something else. And they have had that hunch, but there's nobody confirming the very fact that they should be moving in that direction. And so they come and they do whatever they need to do and they fail. And friends, Sandy and George, we see those failures day in and day out. Sometimes I look at streets and I think, where is that shop going? Why is that business closed over there? You know? And I wonder, was it a good idea or was it a God idea? Was there confirmation from others? Were there two or three that were witnesses that came alongside and said, yes, this is the right thing to do? And so Peter had these people that came to his house and again I reminded that there were three. And uh, he would have been reminded of his spirit about the three times that he denied Jesus, the three times that he was reinstated, and here were three again. He's told the vision three times. Very significant to me, friends. When Scripture says these things, you've got to look at it and say, why is it saying it? Because literally, Peter has been reinstated and he's reaffirmed about the fact that this is God and this is not him. Are we together? And so he listens to these guys and he says, and these, these guys plead with him to come back to Cornelius' house. And so remember that, friends, as you start to make decisions as to whether it's the Lord's will or your will, find people that will come alongside of you that will give you assurance that it is the Lord's voice. And take the hard option, not the easy option. This is a hard option for, for Peter because remember in his narrative he would have known that as he walked into Cornelius' house and as he walked out he would have been unclean. As he went, remember he's done this already, now he's in the amongst the authorities in Jerusalem and he's standing there and I can imagine they were a little bit uncomfortable with him as well. That's why they were irritated. Because he's now unclean, he's been in a Gentile's home and now he's in and amongst them. But in Peter's head, friends, and this is so beautiful, and I think I said it before, but then he said again, he's reminded of the narrative that he had learned from a little boy, the stories of Isaiah and Jeremiah, the story of Daniel, who moved into the Gentiles' territory and transformed things. The story of Joseph, who was in Pharaoh's court and transformed things and brought the kingdom of God alive, managed to enable a whole nation to move from captivity and from slavery into promise. You've got to know that when you're working within the will of the Lord, you are fulfilling something that is historically true. And Peter knew that. And so as he walks into this beautiful home of Cornelius, he finds a family there. <laughs> and uh, and what's, what's exciting about, about this also is not only are there these, these three witnesses but there is also this beautiful interaction with Cornelius and Peter. And he's welcomed in. The doors are open. The doors are not closed. Cornelius is not afraid of this man. He could have been, but he's not afraid. He has a real sense that this man of God has been brought to him for such a time as this. And then in the story and the narrative, friends, you've got to see how beautifully the Holy Spirit is operating and doing what he needs to do in the situation. They realized, that Peter realized, that his eyes were open to the fact that there was something beautiful that had happened with this community and with this family. He remembered in his mind that people were not only baptized in water, but that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he tells the story like it happened in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came on them in the upper room. He says to these religious people, he says, Do you know what? I saw exactly the same thing happening with this family that belonged to Cornelius. And what was to stop me? What was to stop me from baptizing them and bringing them into salvation and into the kingdom of God? What was to stop me? And so the Holy Spirit really leads them into beings, but there is this, this, this confirmation, not only by others, but also by Cornelius himself. I've realized, friends, that in, in my life there are certain people that the Lord has told me to go and speak to. I'm not talking about Christians, I'm talking about others. I'm talking about people that sometimes are hard and hot. You know, you kind of wonder how you're going to ever get into their space. And through conversation and time and energy, 
there is a space that the Holy Spirit brings into being. And the Holy Spirit is working with them as much as He's working with you. And you can sense it. And you just have to ask a small little question, like, how's it going with your soul? How's it going with your soul? And you will find that there is a connection. Sometimes there's tears. Strong men. Mostly men, by the way. But there will be a connection. And the Holy Spirit will be busy. And He will enable you to, to go the next step with the person. And so the Holy Spirit is busy in the heart of Cornelius. The Holy Spirit is busy in the heart of Peter. And there's this beautiful moment in that house where that completely, that whole home was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the church of God was extended and expanded. The old religious people that were sitting in Jerusalem, and that's lovely because they confirm at the end of that scripture, and they say, well, you know, we see what you've said, and so let's not get in the way of God, and let's enable this thing to happen. It says when they heard this, they had no further objections. And they praise God, friends. <laughs> Even the most religious, when they see the Holy Spirit at work, they will praise Him and they will glorify Him. It doesn't matter. They will see what God is doing. And Peter won these religious men over. And the scripture continues to tell us that the kingdom of God was extended on earth as it is in heaven. What's stopping us, friends, from being the same? What's stopping us from the critical spirits in our, in our heads? What's stopping us from doing the very thing again for the sake of the kingdom? It's now or never. You know, the opportunity for us to reach out, the opportunity for us to go into places that are sometimes uncomfortable, the opportunity to press in there, knowing that there is confirmation from others, knowing that there is a sense of, yes, this is the right thing to do. Don't do it if it's the wrong thing to do. There are too many churches that are around today that have become churches for the wrong reasons. And we've got to be careful of that. But find a way to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and move into those places where God wants you to do His work. It might be the simplest thing that you go to the shops today and you're in a queue and you're in, the person in front of you is resting with a few cents in their pocket and you're able just to bless them with some groceries. You know, to make a connection. It may be that the Lord is calling us and, you know, just as I said that thing about going to the homes and seeing what is necessary, where are we going to allow these ladies to end up? That's the question. You know, do they sit again or do we find spaces for them? And maybe we are the vessels of blessing going to houses, going to homes where they are needed most. We had prayers at the, at the police here, I go to the police uh, headquarters, and I meet with uh, Colonel Kennedy. And Colonel Kennedy says there are many people in different parts of George that are volunteering now to keep the people in their areas safe. But they don't have any torches, they don't have any blankets, they don't have any wet weather gear, they need a little flask for their coffee, and uh, you know, they need a little bag so they can put stuff in. And I said to him, man, that's something that we can do. So when Diana comes back, it's going to be on our WhatsApp group to share with others, to say, hey, we can do something. So then not just to go and say, well, we'll just connect and deliver. But let's find a way to connect with them. Let's find a way to cross over the line. Let's find a way to help our city to come alive, to be restored for the sake of the kingdom. Let's be the hands and feet of Almighty God and ask the question, what is Stopping us. Lord, just as we hear the story of Peter and Cornelius this morning, thank you for this amazing testimony. Thank you, Lord, that as you speak to us, you give us vision, you give us direction, you move us into a place of ecstasis. But sometimes, Lord, we need to get rid of that critical voice that's in our hearts and in our minds. A voice that may be very old, that still says you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't go there, you can't go there. Help us to find your voice that spurs us on. Lord, when you spur us on, sometimes we are so overwhelmed by the vision that you've given to us that we would say, surely not, Lord. Is it possible that 
You're calling me to do this. And when we come to that place, so it help us to find others that will confirm that will come alongside us. Holy Spirit, release us to be enabled to do your will. But let us not do it haphazardly, like loose cannons, but with a real sense of confirmation from others and a real sense of confirmation from the people that we go to. As we continue in this, in this time of worship, Lord, I just sense that there may be some things that you are raising up within the hearts of your people right now. God is calling you to do something immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine, something that has been rising up in your spirit, maybe a holy discontent, maybe there's something that is happening inside your spirit right now. And God is saying, I want you to act on it. And remember these steps, friends. Remember what Peter did with Cornelius. But don't allow those narratives of all to stop you. Whatever it might be, find confirmation. Find those who come shoulder to shoulder with you and go forward and do the thing that God has called you to do. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just in the last service, the Anacock service, there was a young guy that came last week and he said to me, he wants to go and run comrades. So I said to him, well, that's good and well. Have you done any comrades before? And he said, no. And I said, well, that's good and well because it's a long way. And he said, no, I know it's a long way. So I said, well, tell me what uh, you've done before. And he told me. He ran the Otanika Marathon in 2 hours 57 minutes. So I said, well, that's a very quick time. <laughs> you're not just a summer runner, you're a runner of notes. <laughs> you can do a, an Otanika Marathon, you know, three to seven passes in 2 hours and 57 minutes. That's good. And they said, Pete, I, I work with all of my heart to get to, 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 to Durban to go and run the Comrades Marathon. Uh, and uh, when he came at the Anacock service, I said to him, I'm going to make a plan to do that. We've already raised almost enough money for him to get to, to, to Marathonburg and to register for the run from the last service. You know, just putting it out there. So um, he's going to be running. We pray for his name, Sammy. And uh, he's a good runner. He's coming in the top three or four in every race that he does now. But pray for Samuel. What's God stirring in your heart to do? Mm. Let's close with a beautiful song, eh? Yeah. Come to you, my friend. Let's have it. is 
praise of God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we we'll see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names. Word Lord, we declare that this morning, how great you are, Lord. We go from this place, inspire us, motivate us, Lord, to step out. Help us to resist that which is stopping us, Lord. And may we be your hands and feet for the sake of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. (laughs) Bless you. And goodbye to you folk that are online. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Love you lots, eh? <laughs> Bless you, my boy. Love you, honey.